In the new movie from Miramax, Gangs of New York, a boy's pain becomes a man's rage in a city set ablaze. There's more of us coming off these ships every day. Get all of us together and we ain't got a gang. We got an army. Challenge. Challenge accepted. I took the father. Now I'll take the son. I give you my word. This will all be finished tomorrow. No, it won't. Gangs of New York will take audiences back to a forgotten crossroads in American history when rival gangs battle for the streets of New York and the future of our country. Tonight, the Discovery Channel will dig up stories about the bandits and the bosses, the hustlers and the hucksters that made old New York a modern Babylon. We'll also show sneak peeks from Gangs of New York, hear candid stories from the set, and listen in on an exclusive interview with director Martin Scorsese. It all starts now on Uncovering the Real Gangs of New York. The real history of the gangs of 19th century New York is the story of the birth of America in these mean streets and the many different faces who forged her identity. As group after group of newcomers arrived on the shores of the city in the early 1800s, each vied with the others for homes, jobs, sustenance, and most of all, respect. The gangs of New York came together out of necessity in a place of chaos. Yes, there's a police department, but you know, what do the police do? Who are they? How many are they? Do they carry guns? Do they not carry guns? Will they be paid for by the city or the state or something else? A lot of these issues are up for grabs. So the, the kind of ordered life that we live in the 21st century was not quite arranged early in the 19th century. The poor neighborhoods had little police protection. A cop was little more than a night watchman on the lookout for fires. So by joining gangs, immigrants were creating their security forces. They needed to band together for protection because if you were solo walking down the street and you haven't turned the wrong corner, you'd get jumped. So you needed backup, you needed your boys. There was a policeman on the corner primarily to assure that the poor did not assault the rich. They didn't care so much about what the poor did to one another. The gangs were rooted in the most dangerous slum in New York, some say the entire world, known as the Five Points. Five Points was named for the intersection of five streets, just a few blocks northeast of where the World Trade Center stood, at the top of what is now Chinatown, and the bottom of Little Italy. Originally, those streets were Cross, Anthony, Little Water, Orange, and Mulberry. Paradise Square flanked the Five Points, just blocks above City Hall. Living conditions in the Five Points shocked and appalled both Walt Whitman and Charles Dickens. Dickens wrote, debauchery has made the very houses prematurely old. No one sets out to build a slum. It was created by default. The Five Points were originally countryside, dotted by a spring-fed lake known by the Dutch as the Collect. When the Collect Pond was drained, it was drained by means of a canal that ran down what is now Canal Street, uh, the area still stank, and only the poorest people wanted to live there. Sewage placed too closely to wells caused cholera and other diseases to run rampant. The sanitation was horrible. I mean, and the living circumstances were horrible because conditions were so horribly crowded. I mean, there were these front tenements, and then there was a back tenement, and then in the little tiny open space in between the front and back tenement was some overflowing ghastly cesspool. And imagine what the smells must have been. It stunk with the excrement of horses and pigs and dogs and cats. And it stunk from rotted food. Americans don't think bathing is so good, and um, it's not a tradition. And the rickety buildings in the Five Points were sinking, literally, into the swampy landfill they'd been built upon. It fell to the lowest on the ladder in New York society to live in the Five Points. That meant recently freed slaves and other new arrivals. Unskilled Irish, who were fleeing famine and willing to work for even less than the black labor force. As the first sizable group of Catholics to arrive in New York, 
the Irish were met with suspicion by distrusting Americans. And that reflected very much a common American belief that the Irish were of a different race, that they were um, racially inferior, uh, religiously inferior, um, really in every way inferior. They also have a tradition of rural violence, of resistance to landlords, of secret society, of gangs that exist in the Irish countryside. And when they come over here, yeah, they resort to the same things that they had there. The immigrants' new neighborhood was impoverished, essentially lawless, and fertile ground for the growth of some of the most notorious gangs this country has ever seen. The classic book by Herbert Asbury, Gangs of New York, An Informal History of the Underworld, chronicles the many gangs' violent exploits. The book became a cult favorite that inspired many other works of history and served as the loose inspiration for the fictional movie, Gangs of New York. When you read this stuff, it's, it's always exaggerated, uh, but it's based on a kind of reality. And it tells you of a world that is basically unknown to most Americans, but as fantastic as the world of the Wild West. Asbury's text is a colorful introduction to an era gone by, starting in pre-Civil War New York. It is based on lurid journalism of the day and oral history and legends of gangs. Well, there were two sorts of gangs, essentially. There were the native-born American gangs, that is, native-born Anglo-Saxons, um, and then there were Irish immigrant gangs. The most important gangs did favors for politicians, they acted as muscle in disputes, they controlled turf, they extorted from shopkeepers, because these were career moves for the poor. The gangs were legendary, and the penny press of the day gave them names and covered their rumbles with glee. There were Bowery Boys and Broadway Boys, Carrionians and Chichesters, the Plug Uglies, and the Dead Rabbits. There's a famous gang called the Dead Rabbits, uh, and historians have speculated a long time about where this name came from. And one professor has pointed out that Dead Rabid is Irish, and the Irish language means big, hulking galoot. So what they really told, somebody, some newspaper man came down to the Lower East Side who didn't know Irish and said, what's that group over there? What are they doing? And someone who spoke Irish said, oh, they're dead rabbits. And then the newspaper reprinted that they're dead rabbits and they became a gang. Their brawls were real enough, and the lingo they generated lasted. Dead rabbits refers to two things. First, the word dead, which means like real, absolute, very much. And uh, rabbit, which is a tough guy. So, so these are the very tough guys, but in the ling flash lingo of the time, they were the dead rabbits. And uh, at least according to legend, they marched into battle with an actual deceased member of the rabbit species impaled on a pole. For the first half of the 19th century, there were no professional firefighters, and all firemen were volunteers. Gangs formed around the various firehouses, which functioned as their private social clubs. Gangs in American cities cannot be separated from the subject of volunteer fire companies. Um, after all, the, the biggest problem in the really before 1800, maybe as late as 1850, in an American city was not what we might think today as crime or mugging or drugs. The problem to them was fire, because if something caught on fire, first of all, the houses were all together, the whole city could go up. Insurance companies of the day rewarded the first fire company on the scene with a cash payout, less for the second to arrive. So you wanted to get there first to get money. What would you do with the money? They didn't hand it out to people. It goes essentially into the party fund. The reward money funded the social life of the firehouse. We know that they were um, sometimes ridiculously inefficient. There are various stories of fire companies duking it out for the privilege of putting out the fire. Meanwhile, the building burned down. If one fire company made it to the scene or a member of one fire company made it to the scene, they would put a barrel over the wooden fire plug in the street and try and defend it uh, from other fire laddies, uh, other fire companies, until their guys arrived. Hence, the term Plug Ugly was born, and another gang was christened. In 1835, during two cold and bitter days in December, a 
massive fire consumed 13 acres of downtown near Wall Street. It was, in terms of its, the physical destruction, probably about equal to the World Trade Center. Uh, disaster in terms of 674 buildings is a lot of buildings. But as a percentage of the city, much more severe in December 1835 than in September 2001. During the fire, mobs rushed down from the five points, looting homes and raiding businesses. Well, one of the reasons people joined a fire company, supposedly, was so that when your place burned, it wouldn't be looted. So there were charges against volunteer fire, and looting was clearly one of them. The fire changed the landscape, the economy, and the way New York dealt with disaster. A movement was now on to make the fire department paid professionals. But the gangs fought this for 25 years to preserve their party funds and autonomy. In Miramax's movie, Gangs of New York, the anti-immigrant gang leader Bill the Butcher is brought to life by actor Daniel Day-Lewis. <laughs> to work again with director Martin Scorsese, Day-Lewis gave up semi-retirement as a cobbler in Venice. But once he took the role, it took over him. My focus was very much taken by Bill. And I was trying to take in the world that was presented in that script. And my challenge, by the ancient laws of combat, we have met at this chosen ground to settle for good and all. Who holds sway over the five points? Daniel Day-Lewis is amazing. He didn't act, <laughs> he became. He literally became Bill the Butcher. He spoke with the accent 24 hours. I was raised in a very similar establishment myself. I think actually it took him a couple of months to drop the accent. Actor Liam Neeson, who plays Priest Valen in the movie, recalls seeing Day-Lewis during early morning workouts at the gym. He would always address me by my character's name, you know. Good morning, Priest. Day-Lewis's character was inspired by the real-life Bill the Butcher, with the minor embellishments of a glass eye and a more fitting surname. We changed the name to Cutting, William Cutting, and sort of kept Bill the Butcher as an idea, and the fact that he, he was a butcher, and also the fact that he, he was famous for throwing his knives. He was very good at knife throwing. Whoopsie daisy! In the second half of the 19th century, the lawless gangs of New York became so dominant that they finally forced the formation of the professional police force. The constables of New York City did not wear uniforms until early in the 19th century. When they first appeared in uniform, they were jeered for looking like London bobbies by a population that despised the English still at that time. And so they quickly reverted to mufti, um, only wearing the badge of their profession in the form of a copper insignia, and hence coppers. Despite efforts to bolster law enforcement, the gangs were thriving as they gained power through patronage with corrupt politicians. By 1855, some estimated 30,000 men in the metropolis owed allegiance to gang leaders, and through them, to the political parties like the Democrats of Tammany Hall and the Native Americans. The Native Americans, or the Know-Nothings, were a gang-like political party of white, native-born, anti-Irish workers. This was the party of Bill Poole, an infamous New York character known as Bill the Butcher. Bill Poole was a hero of the American movement to stop the immigrants from coming in. One of the trades that was really common among the New York working class, Protestant, nativist working class, was butchering. They were tough, they were street people, and he was one of the ones who didn't roll over for the Irish. The fact that he was a butcher was significant because what was happening is that Tammany Hall was issuing licenses for butchers and they were giving them now to more Irish people, or at least it was seen they were giving them with favoritism to the Irish. So the people who were the Native Americans, the true blue Native Americans, were losing out on jobs. Bill the Butcher was a notorious street fighter involved with gambling and running liquor. He died as a result of a major fight with Irish American gangsters of the time and allegedly expired shouting, Goodbye, boys, I die a true American. 
Bill Poole died believing in his vision of America, one where the door should be closed to others once he and his kind were successful. His funeral was one of the biggest parades in the middle of 19th century New York history. And some people see it as the last hurrah for nativist Americans in New York. After Bill Poole's funeral, it's all downhill, and then the Irish begin to take over everything. Irish gangs from the Five Points helped elect Fernando Wood mayor of New York in 1855. Under Mayor Wood, police and governmental corruption reached such depths that by 1857, the state legislature stepped in and appointed a new police force. And this is when the situation really got complicated. The new force was known as Metropolitan and the old as Municipal, but both were still at work. And for a while, these two police forces ran side by side and actually fought each other and released each other's prisoners. And anarchy reigned until finally Wood, was Wood and his municipals were defeated. In the spirit of things, the gangsters of the Five Points and the Bowery engaged in constant fighting, looting, and rioting. On a blazing hot 4th of July, New York saw its bloodiest gang riot yet. Five Points gangs, the Dead Rabbits and the Plug Uglies, raided a Bowery Boys joint, provoking a gang fight that would have made the shootout at the OK Corral look tame. There were so many men attacking each other. They picked up what was lying at hand. They'd have clubs, they'd have knives, bricks, various crank handles, bung starters. It was a full-fledged gang war that had been brewing for a long time, and this was the culmination. Herbert Asbury, author of Gangs of New York, estimated that between 800 and 1,000 gangsters took part. Gangs were flexing their powers as never before, and politicians were eager to use their muscle to their own advantage. There was perhaps no politician in American history as corrupt as William Tweed, known simply as Boss Tweed. He would hold sway over New York for decades, lining his pockets from the city's coffers like no one has since. He was a volunteer fireman. He was a gang leader. He did turn politics into a profession, meaning he wanted to make money from it. He was never himself the mayor. He was the boss. Boss Tweed was the head of Tammany Hall, the Democratic political club that controlled city contracts and handed out jobs. Gangs are part of Tammany's political machine, and gangs begin to evolve under Tweed. They defend polling places, they intimidate people at polling places, they bring in votes, they perform all sorts of street functions, and it becomes hard at certain points to distinguish where the gangs end and where Tammany begins. Tweed consolidated his powers throughout the 50s and 60s by using gangs to steal elections with repeat voting and ballot box stuffing. We look today at anybody who would use violence as, at the polls as, as inherently evil when people in the pre-Civil War years saw that as standard. That was the way politics worked and that that wasn't something to be ashamed of and that wasn't something you'd get arrested for. Gangs would pay voters to grow a beard before election day, then vote, shave several times, and vote several more times as their appearances change. What the Democratic organization wanted was your vote. We need that. And of course it gave you self-respect because in Ireland or later in Italy or Eastern Europe, if you were poor, nobody at the top of the social or political hierarchy in the old world gave a hoot what you thought about anything. You were scum. So they started catering to the Irish vote at a time when other political bodies were scorning the Irish. The Irish had not previously been courted until they were courted by Tammany. New York in the 19th century was corrupt from the top down to the bottom. Pickpockets were commonplace, and many of them were children, any of the estimated 10,000 to 30,000 children who lived on the streets, orphaned or abandoned. Child labor practices were brutal and crime was often a necessary means of survival. Many young women perfected the art of pickpocketing, and they were the most daring. Many young women worked as pickpockets. Pickpocketing was a very important trade at the time, when you had a lot of rich people walking around, and in those days without credit cards, hence carrying you know, significant amounts of cash. And who better 
to pick the pocket of a rich man, especially in a public place, than a comely young woman. And naturally, where there were men, there were women. They stuck close to the gangs in a sort of women's auxiliary. Women like the legendary character called Hellcat Maggie. Yes, apparently there was a character named Hellcat Maggie who wore artificial you know, brass fingernails with which she used to scratch out the eyes of adversaries. And she kept a jar of ears in, um, on a bar, on her bar, where she worked as a bouncer. The Five Points is an area where women fought. Uh, and there's lots of arrests of women in the Five Points. And whether the, some of the, the, the fantastic stories of, of harpies with filed teeth uh, are certainly exaggerations, they were involved in it. And a lot of the fighting involved throwing stuff out of people's windows. They called that Irish confetti. Uh, and it came right out of your house. As rough as life was in the streets of Manhattan, it could still get worse. With the approach of the Civil War, all hell would break loose. New York City, like the nation, would be ripped apart by the Civil War. And in the city, gangs helped incite mob violence. It is a shameful chapter in the city's history, often forgotten. Here, a war would be fought in the streets by citizens gone mad. By 1863, the war was two years old, and the Union was suffering heavy losses. By 1863, it was obvious that the Civil War is not some kind of a party. This is a horrible bloodletting. It's people dying in very large numbers, and, it, and the people who aren't dying, are, their legs are being sawed off, and uh, they're permanently maimed, and it's just horrible. Many breadwinners were lost, and New Yorkers were deeply suspicious of how the war would benefit them in the end. Fears of competition for work with even more newly freed slaves were smoldering. African Americans were being used as strike breakers. They were being brought in uh, past these jeering crowds, very often Irishmen, and they were being escorted by federal troops. Irish immigrants who weathered the dangerous journey to America were asked to die for the anti-slavery cause as soon as they got off the boat. In 1863, President Lincoln called for a draft of 300,000 men. It was the first draft ever held. Name after name were pulled out of a lottery wheel, kindling resentment amongst working men. A deeply unfair clause in the law lit the match. The draft is instituted, and the draft, of course, had this uh, incredible provision that if you could pay $300, you could pay for a substitute to go for you. So the crowd saw this as uh, a rich man's war and a poor man's fight. In July, two days after the draft began, riots erupted. Competing fire companies throughout New York City who were kind of quasi-gangs in themselves. One of them was called the Black Joke Fire Company, and one of their members was drafted when the draft started on July 11th. And when the riot starts on July 13th, it's the Black Joke Fire Company that shows up to start it. Volunteer firemen set the draft station on fire Soon, the entire city was embroiled in the protest. The draft riots in New York in 1863 are not contained. They spill all over the city. Police are fighting uptown and downtown. The army is coming in on First Avenue. There are riots on Eighth Avenue. There's a sense throughout the whole city that every part of the city is threatened. And the federal government is very afraid of losing control of the city. That It's going to be in the control of the mobs. An estimated 70,000 rioters took to the streets and would terrorize Manhattan for the better part of a week. This isn't sporadic looting with the police shooting at people. This is people shooting from rooftops. This is people behind barricades. The streets are barricaded. It has the feel of a revolution as much as a riot. Mobs mutilated, tortured, and killed policemen. It was um, a carnival of rioting, and it was not in any way particularly directed. It seemed to be spontaneous, but it was headless and tailless and resulted really only in death and destruction. African Americans were especially targeted with ferocious cruelty as the mob vented its rage. The draft riots were probably the worst episode in the entire history of the African-American community in New York because blacks were simply hunted down in the streets. 
often lynched from the nearest lamppost or tree. Some of the killings, uh, lynchings of black people were almost ritualistic in their character. Dragging, as one incident of, uh, of a black man who dead was dragged uh, through the streets by uh, a rope attached to his genitals. Police would come by, cut down a body that had been hanged from a lamppost, and then they, uh, when the police left, they'd, they'd hang it back up again. Mobs even stormed and burned an orphanage, the Colored Orphan Asylum, and one little girl was killed. Hundreds of other children were evacuated and brought to a barge on the river for protection. What does that tell us about the degree of anger and hatred at the time that you could destroy an orphanage? I mean, that you would think some places would be off limits, a, a monastery or something like that. You know, these people are out of the fray, but they didn't regard it as out of the fray and they burned it anyway. Mobs took the 21st Street Armory and set it on fire, killing many rioters caught inside. It rained the first night of the riots, which may have stopped the lower part of Manhattan from burning to the ground. A Colonel Henry O'Brien attempted to subdue the rioters and was tortured by the mob and killed by members of a Five Points gang. The rioters took over the Union steam works, garrisoning the plant with 500 men. The governor of New York declared the city to be in a state of insurrection. The crowds only grew more brazen. One mob tried to storm the offices of the Tribune, the newspaper that had thrown the most support behind the Civil War. Well, they were ready for them down there. The Tribune and some of the other newspapers, they had rigged up, you know, they used to use a lot of lead in typesetting. Uh, they had melted lead and they had jerry-rigged these sluices so they could pour melted lead on the crowd when they came to attack them. On July 15th of 1863, Army units fresh from the battle at Gettysburg finally began to arrive in New York. The troops fired on the rioters for 24 hours until the mob was finally subdued. What's horrible about the draft riots, they were out of control for days. The police literally could not stop it. Uh, secondly, that it was up close and personal, that uh, to die in the draft riots or to kill somebody, you had to almost look them in the eye. Herbert Asbury, author of Gangs of New York, compared the death toll of the draft riots to the battle at Shiloh. He cited chronicles of the day that reported more than 2,000 people dead. The truth is, in the mayhem, no one can know the exact number, but it was vast. Many of the victims were poor people with little connection to official bureaucracy. Hundreds of black families chose to leave New York for good. The politician, Boss Tweed, had a hand in quelling the tensions after the riots. Tweed pushed through a special low-interest loan program that made it possible for poor New Yorkers to buy their way out of the draft as well. The move served Tweed, of course, cementing his votes with the poor Irish as the war ground on for two more years. New York had to begin the painful process of reuniting and rebuilding, and there were many who would profit as a result, including, of course, the gangs of New York. None more so than Boss Tweed, though he would soon be exposed at last and brought down by a cartoonist. One of the great figures to come out of this period and out of New York is William Tweed, probably the most corrupt politician in American history. The appearance of the law must be upheld, especially while it's being broken. The way he balanced uh, becoming the benefactor of the poor to a certain extent and also making a lot of money off uh, whatever he got his hands on. And I think you have to understand, Tammany Hall went up to the 1950s, maybe the 60s, with that power, you know, and they affected presidential elections. Deliver these folk to the polls on a regular basis, and there'll be a handsome price for each vote goes Tammany's way. You're a great one for the fighting, Bill, I know, but you can't fight forever. I can go down doing it. And you will. From the ashes of the Civil War, one politician who rose to power took corruption to a level not seen since. The New York Times called Boss Tweed himself the leader of a gang that ruled New York as Napoleon had ruled France. In the climate he encouraged, the real gangs of New York thrived and made more inroads on legitimacy, thanks to the power of their numbers 
and something many of them had never had before, a vote. If you're in the streets and you want to keep control of votes, you almost don't have a choice. You have to deal with the gangs. And Tweed deals with the gangs, and Tweed himself is corrupt, and he's able to use them for many purposes. They're very useful to him. The middle class began to be offended by Tweed's corruption, but not everyone cared. To the immigrants, to the Irish, to the gang members, he was kind of a hero. They didn't care if he was stealing money. Why should I care if he's stealing money? Who's he stealing money from? He's stealing it from the city. But I'm not the city. I'm a new Irish immigrant somewhere. I barely got a job. This is how he stole a lot of the money. Tweed built the biggest monument to corruption left in New York today, the New York County Courthouse, or Tweed Courthouse. And what's known as the Tweed Courthouse was the major boondoggle of the 19th century where they paid astounding prices, you know, buy a chair for $10,000. I mean, I'm exaggerating that, but, but not by much. It was a monument to graft. The New York Times had begun to investigate the outrageous overages in the construction of the Tweed Courthouse. It published front page stories that would shock shameless defense contractors today. 11 thermometers purchased for $7,500, $41,000 for dust brooms, windows at $8,000 each. In today's dollars, the dust brooms alone would be worth $590,000. Tweed's corruption is unveiled or discovered by newspaper reporters who pursue him on that. And he at first doesn't think he's really threatened by it, that he can't be brought down as long as he has the votes. But the courthouse would be Tweed's final undoing. And in the end, it took a cartoonist to topple Tweed. Thomas Nast, the cartoonist, probably had more to do with the downfall of Tweed than any other single human being. Thomas Nast drew cartoons of Tweed and his ring of cronies for Harper's Weekly that were so unflattering, Tweed himself was forced to comment, I don't give a straw for your newspaper articles. My constituents don't know how to read, but they can't help seeing your damned pictures. The newspapers, which are another part of the spreading city and media and public opinion, launch a campaign against them and expose the depths of the corruption that he's brought about, and eventually that leads to his downfall. The government can't do anything but indict him because it becomes very clear who he is and what he's done. The Tweed Ring collapsed in 1871. Tweed was arrested, slapped with legal charges, stripped of his assets, and landed in debtor's prison. He managed to escape to Spain, but Spanish authorities recognized him from Nast's famous cartoons, and he was returned to New York where he died of pneumonia, penniless, in jail. Tweed left a legacy of corruption, but he also built two of America's greatest museums, the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the American Museum of Natural History, and provided thousands of jobs to starving Irish immigrants. Still, many gangs were rooted in the tight, terrible conditions in the Five Points. The most lasting impact of the draft riots on New York City is that people begin to look at the poor and the people living in these hovels and think, well, we can't just let them live like this. Not because we happen to like them, but because if we don't do something about it, it's going to be terribly dangerous. So in the aftermath of the draft riots, you have the first housing legislation, you have the first sanitary laws. Conditions would begin to change in 1877, when a young police reporter named Jacob Reese was assigned to cover the beat around police headquarters and the five points, which he would eventually photograph. Reese would go on to lobby the likes of Teddy Roosevelt for reforms. Leading figures in New York society had lent their names and their efforts and their living rooms to have Reese come in and show his lantern slides. He put a face on the poverty and on the degradation that people were experiencing. And that was important because then as now, if you're not in it, you turn your face in 1879, New York City finally passed a law requiring windows in tenements. Yet the city was still suffering from a depression so severe, it could not afford to even build a pedestal for the new gift from France, the Statue of Liberty. America's identity was far from complete. 